This is Gautam Madani. And that smile, it's a smile of a man who is number two on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Bloomberg will tell you that with his net worth of $142 billion, Adani could buy 86 million ounces of gold or 1.6 billion barrels of oil. 1.6 billion barrels is the amount of oil that the entire country of India consumes in a year. But Adani can't actually buy that much oil. It's not just a matter of practicality. He literally cannot, even if he tried. The reason is because billionaire net worths are hot garbage. If you look at this list, a lot of billionaires have lost a lot of money this year. But Adani is special. He didn't lose money, he gained it. Adani has gained more wealth this year than any other man alive. Between last year and now, he has doubled his net worth. If you look at the losers, Elon Musk has lost 25 billion since January. Bezos has lost 55 billion. This was after the divorce, mind you. Arnold has lost 50 billion. But if you want to find the biggest loser on this list just for 2022, you will have to scroll down to number 22, Mark Zuckerberg. Zook has lost $72 billion since January. $72 billion is three times the GDP of Iceland. If I lost two thirds of my money, I will be homeless. To be honest, I'm almost homeless and I haven't lost anything yet. How can billionaires lose so much money and still remain rich and unbothered? Zook has lost more money than the economies of entire countries by the time he takes a one-night stand to turn into a baby. Why isn't he homeless? The truth of the matter is that these guys haven't actually lost anything. The money was always imaginary to begin with. Hear me out. The problem comes down to how net worth is measured. Your net worth is the total value of your assets minus your debts. If you have $10,000 in the bank and $20,000 in student loans, you don't have a net worth, you're poor. If you receive 11000 from your grandmother as an inheritance, then you will have 21000 in the bank and 20000 in debt, which gives you a net worth of $1,000. I didn't receive an inheritance, but after I did the math, I have found out I have a net worth of 3750 I am not depressed at all. But that is not how many net worths are measured. Billionaire net worths are 100% based on asset valuations. Unlike cash in the bank, asset valuation is not an exact science. Let's take a second example. You're walking down the street and you find a briefcase with $5 million inside. Being the honest man that you are, you track down the owner. And in gratitude, this businessman gives you $300,000 as a finder's commission. For those of you saying $5 million can't fit in a briefcase, please, shut up. How am I supposed to know what $5 million looks like? I've never seen that much money. Or half of that, half of that, half, all the way down to $70. Anyway, back to your example. Now that you have $300,000, your net worth is $300,000. It will remain that way until you spend that money or get taxed or put it all on Red 17 in Vegas. Please don't do that. Being the financial genius that you are, you don't spend it on hookers and coke like a certain friend of mine who will not be named. Instead, you invest it. You buy a house. Let's say you pay $300,000 for the house and rent it out for $1,500 a month. Even though you have spent all the money, your net worth is still $300,000 because the house counts as an investment. Now, let us say an assessor comes along two years later 
and values your house at $600,000. Suddenly, you're twice as rich as you were before. But you don't have the extra 300000 You can only get it if you sell the house. Your tenants will still be paying 1500 in rent, even if the house is worth twice as much as before. Depending on the lease agreement, you may not have the power to raise the rent, even if you could. The tenants will probably move out. And even if they move out, you will still be worth $600,000, even though your house is empty and bringing in no money. Now, suppose a second assessor comes along and gives your house a valuation of 200000 Suddenly, you have lost $400,000 in net worth, but no money has left your pocket. All these gains and losses are imaginary. It's only after you sell the house that the gain or loss can become real. The same net worth issue affects billionaires. The value of their holdings is even more unstable than the fluctuating value of the house in our example. You could always sell your house and finally find out how much it's actually worth. You may not accept $200,000, but you may also not find anyone willing to pay $600,000. But you could accept $320,000 and make a small profit. But what happens to your gains and losses over the two-year period of our thought experiment? The answer, dear viewer, is nothing. That money never existed. It was all imaginary to begin with. In effect, your house was never really worth $600,000 or $200,000. It was always worth $320,000. You just didn't know it yet. The problem with this analogy, of course, is that while you can sell your house, many billionaires can't actually sell their stock and make all their billions of dollars in hypothetical money real. Elon Musk can't sell his Tesla stock. Adani can't sell his Adani group stock, and Bezos can't sell his Amazon holdings. When I say these when I say these guys can't sell, I don't mean it's absolutely impossible if they really wanted to. It's just not practical. It will be like selling your house at the same time that everyone else in America was trying to sell his house. How much money do you think you will get in that situation? Too many sellers, not enough buyers prices go down. It is the same for this kind of billionaires. If Elon Musk tried to sell his Tesla shares tomorrow, they would lose nearly all their value. He's so intrinsically tied to the company that any exit will trigger investors' fears and crush the stock price. Bezos is in a similar position. These billionaires can only sell small quantities of stock. They can never sell everything. This makes a huge chunk of their net worth inaccessible. That inaccessible chunk is imaginary money, useless for every purpose other than wealth ranking. But of the three richest men in the world, Gautama Dani is the most shocked by this phenomenon. Bezos owns 10% of Amazon and Elon Musk owns 17% of Tesla. But Gautama Dani owns 75% of the stock in many of his companies. If Bezos and Musk are trapped, Adani is super triple trapped. The moment he starts selling, the stock in his companies will tank worse than my crypto portfolio. Gautama Adani isn't just the poster boy for billionaires with largely imaginary networks. He is also a symptom of what I believe is a common problem many people ignore with such wealth estimates. That problem is inflated stock prices. Gautama, Gautama Dani's wealth comes from the Adani Group, a collection of seven companies listed on the Indian Stock Exchange in Mumbai. The bulk of his empire centers on food processing, infrastructure management, coal mining, and electricity generation. Over the last two years, Adani went on an aggressive expansion spree. He bought everything from airports and seaports to cement companies and TV stations. This expansion was fueled by a mountain of debt, but that has never stopped investors from dogpiling on a stock if they believe it's gonna go to the moon. 
This usually turns out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more people buy a stock, the higher the price rises. Investors can make a stock go up just by believing that it will go up and vice versa. It is one of the oddities of the stock market. Adani Group stocks went up by over a thousand percent in the last two years because of this. And Gautama Adani in turn went from an obscure Indian billionaire to the number two billionaire in the whole world. But every rocket has to come down, eventually. With the Adani Group, some analysts don't argue over whether the stock will come down. They argue over when. This is due to a little something called PE ratios. If you're a business major, you can skip this part. For the rest of you, the price to earning ratio is the value used to determine a company's profit compared to its valuation. Let us return to our example of the house. You bought it for $300,000 and rented it out for $1,500 a month. In one year, you will collect $18,000 in rent. And just to keep the numbers nice and round, let's say you spend $8,000 a year of that money on property taxes, repairs, and general maintenance. That means that your annual profit from the house is $10,000. If you are making $10,000 a year from a house that costs you $300,000, it will take you 30 years to make back the money you spent buying it. In this case, your house will have a P ratio of 30. That is how you calculate P ratios. Cost over earnings. If you want to lower your P ratio, you need to make more money. In the case of the house, you will have to reduce costs and raise the rent. If it's a company, you do the same thing. You cut costs, find new customers, and try to sell more stuff to your existing customers. Unlike a house's P/E ratio, which is fairly stable, a company's P/E ratio fluctuates with the stock price. If the stock goes up without the company making any additional money, then that company's P/E ratio will rise too. And you don't want a high P/E ratio. A good company to invest in usually has a low P.E. ratio. Toyota, for example, has a P.E. ratio of 8.4. That means if you buy Toyota stock today, you will make back your money in just over 8 years. Overpriced companies, on the other hand, have really high P.E. ratios. Tesla has a P.E. ratio of 109. Amazon has a P.E. ratio of 110. That means if you buy the stock, of any of these companies, it will take you over a hundred years to recover the money you put in. Now, do you want to guess what the P.E. ratio of the Adani group is? 10, 20, 30, 100? No. Yeah. The Adani group is made up of seven companies. Each of them has a different P.E. ratio. The current range is 14 to 700. Adani Power has the lowest P.E. ratio at 14, but the holding company, Adani Enterprises, has a P.E. ratio of 433. If you buy stock in Adani Enterprises, it will take you over 400 years to make back that money. The company with the highest P.E. ratio in the group is Adani Total Gas. Its P.E. ratio is 768. Adani Green Energy has a P.E. ratio of 758. Well, super high P.E. ratios mean that as companies are overvalued, they don't always stop investors from buying. Tesla, for example, has had uh, P.E. ratios as high as 1396. Anyone who bought Tesla stock at the time will have to wait 1400 years to make back the money. So, Tesla's current P.E. ratio of 109 may be high. But it's not 1396, so that's good news. But P.E. ratios aren't the end all. You don't have to wait for a company to pay out profits until you recover all your money. You can sell the stock and make a profit if the share price goes up. This is the reason investors buy stock in companies that have astronomical P.E. ratios. Their goal is to make money on the stock movement.
of the company's earnings. They don't care if the share price goes down in the long term as long as they can make a short term gain. Tech stocks usually get away with high PE values because the expectation for growth is so high. A power company or a phone company isn't going to grow its profits by 300% in a single year. Everybody has a phone and everybody has electricity. Those who do not usually cannot afford them. It is the same reason that Apple and Facebook have 10 PE ratios in the 20s despite being tech companies. That's because these are mature companies. They are well past the exponential growth phase. Everybody who wants an iPhone or a Facebook account already has one. Facebook and Apple are not going to grow dramatically and increase user numbers. They have already reached saturation and any future growth will be slow. But a company like Tesla still has a lot of room to grow. It sold 500,000 cars in 2020. In 2021, the number was nearly double that, at 936,000. That same year, over 15 million cars were sold in the United States alone. To say nothing of the global market. Tesla may dominate the electric car niche, but its overall share of the car market is tiny. In the US, it's 2.5%. Outside the US and Northern Europe, it's practically zero. This leaves Tesla with a lot of room to grow. And this is what allows it to get away with PE ratios of 100 or even 1400. The stock price has already taken that feature growth into account. Toyota, on the other hand, has a fairly low PE ratio of 8.4 because investors don't expect it to grow dramatically. In fact, Toyota has consistently been selling slightly fewer cars each year since 2019, while Tesla is doubling its sales figures year on year. This brings us to Gautama Dani. He doesn't run a tech company, and yet the PE ratios of his companies are just as insane. We haven't talked about Adani's business, so here we go. He owns and runs India's largest seaport, its second largest airport and a string of smaller ports, airports, toll roads and railroads. He also mines coal, sells electricity from coal-fired power stations and is deeply invested in manufacturing commodities like food and cooking oil. Recently, he got into green energy and construction. These are all important sectors, especially in India, so Adan isn't struggling to attract customers. But they are also not high growth sector. You could start a tech company today and have a billion users in two years. But a power company isn't going to grow that fast. Yet Adani's companies have PE ratios comparable to those of the most overvalued tech startups. All of Adani's companies will be overpriced except Adani Power. And it's not just an Indian thing. Indian companies are not generally overvalued. Take uh, Reliance Industries, for example. This is a company owned by Adani's fellow Indian billionaire Mukesh Ambani, the ninth richest man alive. Reliance has a PE ratio of 25. What does all this mean anyway? Sadly, not much. Adani's companies may be overvalued, but it doesn't mean a lot in the grand scheme of things. Even if you believe his net worth is overblown and then the stock market self-corrects to prove you right, his life is not going to change. Adani will go from the richest person in India to the second richest after Mukesh Ambani. He's not going broke because of a stock movement. Like I said before, billionaire net worth figures are mostly imaginary. I can't say exactly to what extent, but 40 to 70 percent at least. Net worths are a terrible way of measuring wealth. Do we have better alternatives then? The most reliable way to measure wealth would be income. But tax laws mean that the rich avoid getting paid in cash whenever they can. Guys like Elon Musk don't take a salary, they just get paid in stock. And stock is taxed at a lower price than income. And you also don't pay taxes on stock until you sell it. 
The second way of measuring wealth is liquidity. While billionaires like Musk, Bezos, and Adani are very illiquid, others are very liquid. The most liquid billionaire is probably Warren Buffett. Buffett's wealth is also tied to one company, but there's one major difference. Berkshire Hathaway is an investment company, that is, a company that owns other companies. Because its portfolio is so diversified, Berkshire Hathaway can sell many of its holdings without crushing the market. This would allow Warren Buffett to convert close to 100% of his net worth into cash. Practically no other billionaire can do this. Many in the top 10 have all their money tied up in one company that will immediately tank if they try to sell. Many will be lucky to realize 20% of the advertised net worth if they sold everything they owned tomorrow. In fact, if you rank billionaires by how much of their wealth they could convert into cash, Warren Buffett will be number one. Bill Gates will be number two. He has been slowly selling his Microsoft stock over the last 40 years, but Microsoft shares still make up a quarter of his net worth. He can't sell them all at a go without taking a big hit, but he's almost as diversified as Buffett. I haven't tried to calculate much beyond that. This is because calculating wealth by liquidity is time-consuming and complicated and not too reliable. The liquidity levels will vary from billionaire to billionaire. And you will also need their cooperation. Many of them will refuse to disclose their finances. We will be stuck with this method for the foreseeable future. Now, if you are a billionaire, what will you do to actually make your net worth real? The only viable option is divesting. This is where you slowly sell shares in your companies until there's nothing left. But divesting is not a silver bullet. Bill Gates has been divesting from Microsoft for 40 years and he is still not done. There are also downsides to this approach. If Bill Gates had not sold his Microsoft shares and just held on to the 49% he had in 1986, he would be worth $850 billion today. But because he has been slowly selling, he's only worth $100 billion. So, what would you rather have? $800 billion you can't touch? Or $100 billion you can convert into cash within a month?